What brings you joy? The smile of a loved one? Falling leaves on an autumn afternoon? A surprise visit from a dear friend? Being surrounded by your church family singing your favorite hymn? I bet many of these things, and much more certainly, make you happy? Give you a smile? Make you glad to be alive? But what about joy? What is joy? Hi, I'm Matt Henderson, pastor of First Presbyterian Church of Clarksville, Georgia, and that's one of the central questions I'll be exploring in this sermon series on the Epistle of Philippians. I've titled it, Joy? Discovering Joy in All Circumstances. I'm providing this introduction as an online experience recorded here on my back deck. For Philippians has such a full and rich lesson for us, I couldn't squeeze it all in in a satisfactory manner in the remaining weeks before Advent. So I'm offering a few supplemental messages online. Philippians, a letter of Paul, is known as the Epistle of Joy. And in the four chapters alone, Paul mentions joy at least 16 times. It shows up early in the fourth verse and then regularly thereafter. And it's not just the theme, his letter to this favorite church, but it's the prevailing desire he has for them to experience as well. What brings you joy? Separation from loved ones? Hunger and thirst? Sickness? Affliction? Persecution? Imprisonment? You'd probably not equate any of those things as a source of joy, but for Paul, who is writing from prison, separated from his loved ones, experiencing persecution and affliction, and whose diet was regularly lacking, he continues to rejoice 16 times. He also mentions Christ 50 times. That's because his joy is found in Christ, and so is our joy. We'll be reading together through the four chapters of Philippians over the next six weeks. Again, although most will be covered in our weekly Sunday worship, there will be a few, like this introduction, they will be squeezed in as an extra opportunity online via our YouTube page or our podcast. Before we begin today with Philippians chapter 1, verses 1 through 11, let me set the stage just a bit. You can read the story of Paul's first visit to Philippi in Acts chapter 16. There, he was illegally arrested and beaten, was placed in the stocks, and was humiliated before the people. But even those memories brought joy to Paul because it was through this suffering that the jailer found Christ, and Paul recalled Lydia and her household, the poor slave girl who had been demon-possessed, and other dear Christians at Philippi, and each recollection was a source of joy. The letter makes it clear that as Paul looked at all the churches he had founded, the people of Philippi were the ones who gave him the most joy. Paul is writing from prison perhaps even his last imprisonment while in Rome. Now, Paul had previously been imprisoned, also in Ephesus and Caesarea, and scholars don't agree on just when this letter was written. But most importantly to recognize is the fact that Paul is separated from those he loves, is experiencing harsh circumstances, and yet is expressing joy. Now, about joy. Earlier in Paul's life, he wrote those now familiar words to the church in Galatia, chapter 5. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against such things. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh 
with its passions and desires. And if we live by the Spirit, let us also be guided by the Spirit. Let us not be conceited, competing against one another, envying one another. So among love, peace, gentleness, Paul describes joy as a fruit of God's Holy Spirit living within us, producing not a natural emotion, but a supernatural ability. The ability to not just survive in all circumstances, but to rejoice. Joy is a result of a life of faith in the Spirit, guided by God in the direction of others. I'll continue to help us define and understand joy as we go along throughout the series, but for now, consider this as our working definition. Joy looks beyond oneself, beyond selfish desires, and acknowledges and delights in the needs, gifts, and blessings of others. And it's to others, Paul's dear ministry partners, that he writes with affection and joy. Philippians chapter 1. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus. To all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, with the bishops and deacons, grace to you, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God every time I remember you constantly praying with joy in every one of my prayers for all of you because of your sharing in the gospel from the first day until now. And I am confident of this, that the one who began a good work among you will carry it to completion by the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to think this way about all of you because you hold me in your heart. For all of you share in God's grace with me, both in my imprisonment and in my defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness. How long? For all of you with the compassion of Christ Jesus. For this is my prayer that your love may overflow more and more with knowledge and full insight to help you to determine what is best so that in the day of Christ you may be pure and blameless, having produced the harvest of righteousness that comes through Christ Jesus for the glory and praise of God. Remember, Philippians is a letter, although likely intended to be shared among a, a community, it is difficult to imagine that Paul envisioned it being published with a worldwide audience. And as it is, a letter in Paul's days had common structure, which began with the opening salutation and signature. One can look at the opening lines and easily determine if the letter is formal or informal, official or casual, between friends or strangers. Now Paul has a variety of opening signatures and by comparing them you can discern the differing situations in which they are written. For example, Paul's lengthy six-verse signature with full credentials in the Romans letter tells the reader that Paul is writing to strangers. The cold and official signature in Galatians announces tension immediately, whereas the warmly emotional signature in Philemon alerts the reader that Paul will be using the relationship as a ground for asking a favor. But here in Philippians, the absence of Paul's usual credentials as an apostle says that his relationship with the readers makes that unnecessary. They know him. They know his ministry. But neither does Paul permit his affection for the Philippians to substitute for the central subject matter to the gospel. He prefers to sign his name Paul, a servant 
of Christ Jesus. And this flavors the entire letter, for he will call upon them to be servants of one another, just as Christ himself took the form of a servant. Paul is overflowing with joy for these dear ones in Philippi, partners in the ministry of the gospel. In fact, this letter is all about partnership, which is one of the big important words in Paul's vocabulary. It's sometimes translated fellowship, but it has deeper implication, which our word fellowship doesn't always carry. In fact, though fellowship develops particular Christian meanings, which will include the delighting sharing of worship, prayer, and the mutual support and friendship, which is what fellowship normally means today, in Paul's world, it was the normal word for a business partnership in which all those involved would share in doing the work on the one hand and in the financial responsibilities on the other. The Philippians, they are partners in the gospel, partners in grace. They are in this gospel business, the grace business, along with Paul. What brings you joy? Does your work bring you joy? It might if your work is the business of the gospel. Your work might bring you joy if you work with precious partners who share the heart of grace. Your work might bring you joy if you are surrounded by people of grace who hold you in their hearts as you hold them in yours. I rejoice and give thanks for you, my partners in ministry, you saints of grace, you who hold me and my family in your hearts during this season of our struggle. I never fathomed how in an instant life could change, but yet in the midst of it all, we have been surrounded by your compassion and kindness. You have been selfless in your care for us, and we are thankful. And we certainly hold you in our hearts as we work together in this grace business. In the coming weeks, as we together explore Philippians and joy together, alongside the biblical context and the practical applications that you normally would expect, there will be some opportunity for some significant personal sharing about what joy looks like while recovering in the hospital, or struggling to make sense of life when your wife is bedbound, learning to walk, to eat, to do the things she once did so easily, but now struggles to do. And in the coming weeks, I'll share personally some of my own faith struggles, as well as how God has used you to minister to us, and how we are partners in God's grace. We all experience the diverse circumstances that define life. We usually say it's ups and downs, it's joys and sorrows. Yet there's a sense that in Philippians, all of life, both its ups and downs, should be joys. So let's see together if that can be true for us all. On Sunday, we'll explore chapter 1, verses 12 through 20 as Paul explains his circumstances a bit deeper and how even through his imprisonment, God is working for the good. So until then, the peace of Christ be with you.